And uh, I would like to say welcome to uh, Professor Emeritus Peter Pöldre. We've used to listen to you at Tartu College. Usually you show us some great photos you took in the summertime or of what the Laulu video or something. Mm -hmm. And there are sort of usually very joyful topics you're talking about. This time it's totally different. Although you have a lecture for the next year with your nice pictures, but this COVID lecture would be really very serious and I think very important because we all need information we can trust and i can say peter that we all trust you so please now you can start sharing on the screen there we go there can everybody see that so far so good mm -hmm. and that you can see it yep okay all right well, Bina, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, make this presentation. I'm going to talk about COVID-19, of course, and uh, I've divided it into three unequal sections. A little bit about the important past, a lot about the present, and some speculations about the future. What I just wanted to, first of all, tell you about is where I usually get my information sources from. As an alumnus of the University of Toronto, I'm very fortunate that, that five days a week, both morning and afternoon, we get media releases on a whole host of topics, not just COVID, but much of the last eight months has been dominated by COVID information from experts that are quoted widely in both the Canadian and the American, and for that matter, the European, media, so very reliable sources. I also have become a fan of the British Broadcasting Corporation podcast, which occur twice daily on weekdays and once per day on weekends. And this has provided an incredibly valuable international perspective on what's happening. Now, I want to start with a little bit of information about the past, and that is the period from March of 1918 to April of 1920, to what was called the Spanish flu. Now, one of the fascinating things about the Spanish flu is that it undoubtedly did not originate in Spain. It's got its name in a very unusual way. Many of you will recognize that in 1918, most of the world was at war. Spain was not. The rest of the world had wartime censorship. Spain did not. And it was the Spaniards who were reporting the devastating effects of the influenza that was occurring in Spain. And hence, the name Spanish flu came to be. Interestingly enough, in Spain, they referred to it as the French flu, which of course is not an uncommon thing that we see these days when rivals try to pin the blame on other, or, uh, other parts of the world. Now, the Spanish flu occurred at a time when the world population was about 1.5 billion. The flu in that period of time infected a third of the world population, with a fatality rate that most experts from that era estimate at 10%. 50 million people died of the Spanish flu. It occurred in four separate waves the spring and the fall of 1918, the winter of 1919, and again in the spring of 1920. Of interest, Babe Ruth, the baseball player, survived the Spanish flu, but Donald Trump's grandfather actually died in the Spanish flu epidemic. And of real relevance to us here and now today is that the majority of deaths in the Spanish flu occurred in the second wave not the first, third, or fourth wave. If you look back at the historical documents, masks and social distancing were ever present there. But even in the United States, different approaches were used. In two cities that are of relatively comparable size, St. Louis and Philadelphia, St. Louis imposed a significant lockdown. Philadelphia basically said, we don't have to do anything and the mortality rate was substantially worse in Philadelphia. Lessons learned from 102 years ago. 
the Spanish flu was caused by influenza H1N1, the same virus as affected us 11 years ago in 2009, which we called the, the swine flu. And the final important thing about the Spanish flu is the majority of deaths in the Spanish flu recognized by autopsy studies occurred because of bacterial superinfection. In other words, pneumonia caused by bacteria. And you'll remember that penicillin, for example, was not available until at least 10 or 15 years after this period of time. The other historical perspective I wanted to share with you, which is certainly a little bit more personal for me because I was heavily involved with this, was SARS in 2003, fully now 17 years ago. And Ontario and Toronto especially was a major epicenter of SARS. And I wanted to just briefly outline what happened in SARS. We know this history very well. On the 23rd of February of that year, an index patient, the original cause of SARS in Ontario, came from Hong Kong to Toronto, went home, but was not hospitalized. It was this patient's son, after she died, that came to hospital, to the Scarborough Emergency Department, and he turned out to be what we now understand as being a super spreader. This one individual patient, the son of the index patient who died at home, infected one doctor, eight nurses, five patients, two clerks, two technicians, and eventually 128 cases in one hospital alone and 17 deaths. That's what a super spreader can do. A very horrifying situation. In Canada, in total, there were only 438 cases of SARS, but a 10% fatality rate, 44 people, including three healthcare professionals. The only two epicenters in the world for SARS were Toronto and Singapore. Mm -hmm. And the lessons that we had not learned from SARS was first of all, to restrict nurses and other healthcare workers to only one site. And if you reflect back on what was happening a couple of months ago, especially in long-term care facilities, you'll recognize that many patient, personal support workers were having to work in multiple sites lesson not learned from 17 years ago. In addition, the Campbell Commission, which followed the SARS epidemic, stressed the need for personal protective equipment, especially N95 masks, which we'll talk about later. Another lesson not learned, because in the first couple of months of our epidemic of 2020, we did not have sufficient supplies of PPE, personal protective equipment. The other interesting thing about SARS is that it barely made a dent in the United States. There were a total of 27 cases of SARS only in the US without a single death. And I'll relate later on why I think that's relevant. I titled this next slide, The Scars of SARS, because many physicians who are in leadership positions now were veterans of the SARS epidemic they have a heightened awareness of the implications of a pandemic. They studied carefully what was happening in Milan and Italy earlier this year, and what happened a few months later in New York City, and they fused those horror tales onto the experience that we had in 2003. I was a hospital VP at Sunnybrook in 2003. We had the largest single number of cases of SARS in Sunnybrook, and every staff physician at Sunnybrook is acutely aware of how devastating a pandemic can be, especially to our ICU resources. And what I've written in red is just to remind people that ICUs are not simply for COVID patients, but they're for patients who have gotten car accidents, who have required major surgery, who have had major cancer operations. So when we think about ICUs, which we'll talk about a little bit later, Think not just about COVID, but, but something that can accidentally or unintentionally affect any one of us on this call tonight. And that resulted earlier this year in the virtual shutdown of most non-emergent healthcare as a result of the experiences that we had at SARS and anticipating what might have happened had we not done that shutdown earlier this year. 
And this will be a recurrent theme that we're going to talk about toward the end of today's presentation. Now, just a very brief comparison between SARS and COVID-19. SARS patients had a very short time without symptoms. There were very, very few SARS patients that had mild symptoms. They were sick when they came into hospital. And therefore, the so-called silent spread was very unlikely with SARS. Whereas COVID-19, the most devastating thing about COVID-19 is that you can be contagious for up to 14 days before you feel sick. And the majority of patients we've discovered over the year have had mild or virtually no symptoms, yet can be a spreader. And so silent spread is a huge, unprecedented issue with this particular virus. As I mentioned before, SARS only had two epicenters, whereas there are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of epicenters for COVID. And the total global case count for SARS was only 8,000, with 774 documented global infect deaths, with a fatality rate of 10%, very similar to the Spanish flu. Right now, as of this morning's report, there were over 56 million global cases of COVID, over 1.3 million deaths, but I don't want to emphasize and estimate in any way, shape or form a fatality rate because of the divergent ability for many countries in the world to accurately report what's happening with their COVID patients. Now, this is a slide that I created specifically to provide some perspective in terms of what other civilized countries are going through right now. This is a slide where you do not want to be on the top of the slide, you'd rather be on the bottom of the slide. And it's deaths per million population. And obviously there, are, there could be a hundred points of data on this, but I've selected relatively civilized countries that have a lesson that we can learn from. The worst civilized country on this list with 1,232 deaths per million population is Belgium. The next most important number relates to the United States and the United Kingdom, both around 760 deaths per million population. And both, if you would excuse a bit of political commentary, have leaders that at most times are not completely normal. I, next, I wanted to point out Sweden, because many of you may have remembered over the first couple of months of the pandemic that the Swedish epidemiologists took a very different approach. They said, listen, our population is wonderful. They know what to do. We don't have to do any kind of restrictions because the average Swede is smart enough to know what to do. So smart that they're now weighing in at 609 deaths per million. Canada is at 288. The Ukraine and Russia are both around 220. Germany, another relatively civilized country with a, a tradition of being very strict about its procedures is down to 151. Now Estonia, as well as the other Scandinavian countries with the exception of Sweden is at 61 and all the other Scandinavian countries are in the same ballpark. And at the very bottom of this list, or the top of this list as it should be, Japan and Korea at 13 deaths per million, and New Zealand, the island nation, is, have been able to protect itself so that it only has five deaths per million. There are multiple lessons that could be learned about why this is the case, and I'm not gonna go into a great deal because a lot of it relates to the public health measures, the contact tracing, and so on, as well as the overall approach to why some of these countries, all of which I think we would consider civilized, are doing much better than Canada. And obviously the reflection on those countries that aren't doing as well as we are, and we could do a lot better because of the way in which they've approached these issues. Now, the mode of transmission of COVID is not straightforward. Interestingly enough, if you begin to study this literature, there's no scientific agreement on the size difference between what we refer to as a droplet and what we refer to as aerosol. And over the last couple of months, there's been a wider appreciation of the fact that there's a likely spectrum in uh, COVID transmission between droplet and aerosol. Now, in very simple terms, we can think of a droplet as being large, like a raindrop. 
It briefly lands in the air, but falls quickly with gravity. And guess what? This is where the two meters comes from. But droplets also contaminate surfaces. And that's one of the reasons why droplet spread is oftentimes also referred to as contact spread. These droplets tend to land in the upper airway. In comparison, aerosol, or what's also called airborne transmission, can be thought of in simplistic terms as like mist. It stays in the air longer. We really don't know what the safe distance of it is. And the mist, because it's smaller, can land in the lower airway. So for practical purposes, although a lot of the early attention for COVID-19 was focused on droplet or surface spread, I think there's an appreciation that there's a component of airborne or aerosol spread that is occurring. But if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, the important thing about droplet or surface spread is try to avoid not touching your face, wash your hands frequently, and clean surfaces. Because most authorities still believe that the droplet spread is the more important and obviously the more manageable part of COVID transmission. What does this then mean for masks? There are a lot of controversy about masks. And what I'm going to talk about is a traditional surgical mask and then the N95 respirator mask. Now, surgical masks are fundamentally intended to keep particles in. And ironically, it's the patient who's being protected from the surgeon when they're wearing a surgical mask, not the other way around. The surgical mask is more comfortable to wear but as a result of that, it's also easier to wear improperly and can oftentimes give a false sense of safety if it's not used properly. And it tends to be relatively inexpensive. On the other hand, N95 respirators are intended to keep particles out. And in the medical profession, we use that when we're putting breathing tubes down people, so-called intubation because the intubation process actually causes the aerosol or the fine mist that I was talking about before. The N95 mask is considerably less comfortable to wear. And therefore, even amongst trained, knowledgeable healthcare professionals, there is less compliance with wearing an N95 mask. And N95 masks must be individually fitted. So every physician at Sunnybrook, for example, has to have their N95 fitted every two years. And you're given a card with the specification as to what brand and what number of mask you have to wear. And of course, these masks are also considerably more expensive, but have to be used in the proper environments, especially where aerosol spread is expected. Now, the next slide, I'm going to talk briefly about how fatal COVID-19 is. And I'm going to suggest that the COVID-19 fatality is somewhat uncertain. We know the official tally that comes from hospitals and regrettably long-term care facilities because it's reported in the media. What we don't know is how many patients are dying at home, likely related to COVID-19 infection, but not having tested for it. What we don't know is how many patients are dying at home likely related to, date, uh, to delayed surgery or delayed diagnosis? How many patients have or will die at home likely related to patient reluctance to seek emergency care? Because you'll recall that in the early months of the pandemic, there was a substantial 50% or more decrease in emergency visits. And many of those emergency visits probably should have happened but patients were reluctant to go to emergency. And then finally, and sadly, fatal overdoses and suicides are also part of what I would call the true uncertainty relating to COVID fatality. Now we have some interesting sources of data to actually support that. We'll start with the Canadian sources. Between March and May of 2020, multiple Canadian provinces who had this data available, and that did not include Ontario and Quebec, were reporting 30% more deaths than they would have had in exactly the same period 
in 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019. And monthly mortality per province is actually a very stable number. There's not much of a change that occurs normally in terms of how many patients die, how many people die in any given month in any given province. What was even more compelling is the data that came out last month from the United States. The United States data source present, pr produced data for the six month period from March to October of 2020. In the United States, there were 300,000 more deaths than expected. But we know that at that same time period, only 221,000 of those deaths were COVID. Therefore, roughly 80,000 more deaths occurred, probably many related to the list that I just started with a couple of slides ago. In addition to mortality, it's very important to think about morbidity and the morbidity that comes from COVID. Patients who have had COVID have what is loosely called a post-COVID syndrome. People who have been ventilated have significant psychological problems as a result of being on a ventilator. And many patients who have recovered from COVID will still have physiologic problems, such as persistent cough and shortness of breath, cognitive disorders, something that neurologists loosely call brain fog, the same kind of syndrome that can occur after chemotherapy, as well as a whole host of complaints related to generalized fatigue, malaise, simply being unable to function. So even if you're fortunate enough to have a mild case or recover from a serious case, there is morbidity, which is the technical word for when you're not fatally involved, that occurs with the COVID infection. In addition, for those people who are not infected, which hopefully is most of us, if not all of us on this call, there are psychological effects that we need to be aware of. Depression and worsening of mental illness for those people who already have it. Domestic stresses, domestic violence and abuse, divorces are up. And of course, a whole host of things related to financial hardships. So this is in many ways, shape or form, a very devastating situation that we're dealing with. Now, I wanted to turn to a few more optimistic slides and talk a little bit about management of COVID-19. And a couple of, and these, this is by no means comprehensive, but things that I thought a, a general audience should be aware of. First of all, Dalhousie University, starting this last uh, month, has begun to do a study to see whether they can detect the viral load in blood to predict how future severity of the disease will occur. And this will become important for some of the therapeutic agents that are referred to a couple of slides from now. In addition, there's a lot of interesting work being done in medical imaging in the x-ray department using artificial intelligence methods to actually quickly and effectively diagnose COVID lung disease. There has been an enormous amount learned about how to give oxygen to patients, something that we would never have thought of nine months ago. When to give oxygen, how much to give, in what manner. A lot of research has suggested, for example, that having patients lying on their belly or prone, as opposed to being on their back or supine, is a more effective way of getting oxygen into patients. So people like ICU specialists who've been doing this for their whole career, all of a sudden have begun to discover various different ways of providing oxygen, the when, the how, the how much. And so if you remember the story of Boris Johnson going into the UK hospital, he wasn't immediately intubated because even by that time, the physicians realized that giving oxygen by nasal prongs or by mask might've been a safer alternative than having the person have a breathing tube put down into their throat. Now, a few slides about treatment. Without a doubt, the most important treatment that is well recognized and easily used is dex dexamethasone, high dose corticosteroid. 
dexamethasone is very inexpensive. It's been used for decades by multiple types of specialists for various kinds of conditions. And it's important because there is an incredible inflammatory effect of COVID. Unlike the Spanish flu, where bacterial infection killed most people, there are concerns that many people die of COVID lung disease because of inflammation, not infection. The story isn't quite as optimistic for actual antivirals. Many of you have heard about a, a drug called remdesivir, which was given to the American president, the current but not future American president, just for the record. And in addition, Jordan Feld and his colleagues in Toronto are studying another antiviral called lambda interferon. These are agents that will decrease the severity and decrease the time of a patient in hospital, but they will not cure the disease the way an antibiotic would have cured a super infection back 100 years ago. There's a lot of interest and a lot of uh, interest in terms of using antiplatelet agents such as aspirin. McMaster is doing a study on that. And many patients now who have to be in the intensive care unit with COVID are actually given anticoagulants, drugs like heparin, because thrombosis or the making of huge blood clots has become a very serious complication of COVID. And many of you who may have followed the story of the Broadway actor, Nick Cordera, he lost his legs and lost his kidney function because of blood clots related to COVID, a very serious complication that's now being treated aggressively with anticoagulation in the intensive care unit. Now, this is a screenshot that I took several months ago of my colleague at Sunnybrook, Jeannie Callum, who is leading a study of convalescent plasma for patients who are hospitals with acute COVID respiratory illness. And there's a very interesting connection and a story behind convalescent plasma. So what happens is that plasma is collected from COVID-19 patients about four weeks after they have recovered from their COVID infection. Almost two thirds of these patients will have sufficient antibodies to be used for this particular work. Those, that, that collection is then pooled, and from the pool of plasma, 50, uh, 500 milligram or milliliter aliquots are infused over four hours into patients who are in hospital but not sick enough to need to be ventilated. What happens is the antibodies, the IgG antibodies in that pooled plasma inhibit the binding of the virus into the cells. And currently, Jeannie and her colleagues have 50 research sites in Canada and in New York City, and their goal is to accrue 1,500 patients in this study. Now, convalescent plasma is not new. In 1901, Emil von Behring won the very first Nobel Prize in medicine for demonstrating that you could generate convalescent plasma for the therapy of diphtheria and tetanus. So this is old technology, but put to use because people were aware of history. We now have an even more targeted approach, and that is the treatment with monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are artificially created. They must, however, be used very early in disease, and hence if you refer back a couple of slides to the Dalhousie study looking at viral load, it may be possible to measure viral load and determine that this is or isn't the right kind of patient to use monoclonal antibodies. Now, there are two major monoclonal antibodies that are in play right now. One by a company called Regeneron, and you may have picked this up because the President of the United States, along with the dexamethasone and remdesivir, this was the monoclonal antibody injection that he got on his first day of infection. The Eli Lilly product currently doesn't have a cute name, but its scientific name is bamlavidumab. And anything with an MAB at the end of it means that it's a monoclonal antibody. So that's the, that's the way in which physicians will identify something as being a monoclonal antibody. Now, a very disturbing but important observation was made in the United Kingdom last month. And that is that even with an infection, 
COVID-19 antibodies post-infection do not last for a long time. And this has become very important in terms of not only determining whether people are genuinely immune after they've gotten an infection, but it will also have a major role in determining what vaccines may or may not be able to do. Typically, in most medicine, we assume that a natural infection is a better protection than a vaccine, but that may not be the case with COVID-19. Another unfortunate twist uh, in this uh, very unusual virus. Now it's time to talk a little bit about vaccines. And I'm sure that many of you who have followed the media will recognize the American Operation Warp Speed. There has been a lot of concern about the rush to results, science by press release, and the notion that the vaccine will be the holy grail of the pandemic. We're gonna discuss this in some detail over the next couple of slides, and I hope to provide for you a somewhat balanced approach to this particular issue. But before we do that, I wanted to just uh, do a bit of clinical trials 101 and just explain to many of you who may not be familiar with this terminology, the basics of a clinical trial. In what's called a phase one study, there are typically somewhere between 50 to 100 volunteers that are given doses of the potential vaccine to first of all determine whether it's safe and also to determine whether that vaccine actually generates an immune response. And you may have remembered back in, uh, especially I think it was May, where Moderna was able to triumphantly report that as a result of its phase one studies, yes, indeed, their vaccine was able to generate an immune response. The next phase, called phase two, typically has about 500 volunteers. And here, they're studying what dose, what schedule, and also always keeping track of, is it still safe? Once the appropriate dose of a vaccine and the schedule administration, whether it's once a day, once a week, once a month is determined, then it's time for phase three studies. And phase three studies, as I'll demonstrate shortly, typically involve tens of thousands of volunteers. And the vaccine is paired with placebo. So typically in a conventional study, half of the patients will get the vaccine and half will get something that looks like the vaccine, but is essentially salt water or saline. And the phase three study is intended to see whether the vaccine works, and of course, always continuing to look to see whether it's safe. Now, on the left-hand side is a description of the conventional vaccine trial. Thousands of volunteers, vaccine or placebo, in that particular case, after the injection, the volunteer is expected to live normally. Just go out there and go and work, go and play, do whatever you want to, and only come in if you're feeling unwell. The interesting thing about this is that those volunteers really should be working in an area where COVID-19 is present. It would be worthless to give vaccines to people who are staying at home, because the whole point of this particular kind of conventional approach is putting people into a so-called natural environment to see if they catch the infection. And it's for that reason, folks, that it takes many months, if not years, for the results of a conventional trial to occur. On the other hand, and much more controversial, are what are called challenge trials. Challenge trials typically require only a small number of volunteers, let's say about 100. They're only given the vaccine. And after the vaccine, they are deliberately infected with the virus. These people don't go home. They live in a separate facility for a month. They're monitored 24 seven. They're paid a substantial amount of money. This number of 6,500 comes from flu vaccine challenge trials. But the benefit to society theoretically is that you can get the results in a much shorter period of time. There are some significant ethical considerations with challenge trials because in most challenge trials, and they're done in many other situations, there is a treatment 
in case the person gets sick with the infection. The, psych the, the, uh, the uh, ethical dilemma with COVID-19 is that an infected person doesn't necessarily have a guaranteed escape valve by getting therapy. That's why it's so controversial. There is one Oxford-related trial that is pending to go in January of 2021. With the success of the conventional studies, it's going to be interesting to see whether that challenge trial continues. Now, you may ask, who the heck would even volunteer for that? And that's the other problem, because typically who volunteers for challenge trials are relatively young, healthy people. And their motivation for doing this usually is recognizing that they can contrib contribute significantly to societal good if, in fact, a very short time frame can establish whether a vaccine is good or not. But very controversial and may not be necessary if the conventional trial results hold up. Now, when vaccine trials are ongoing, there are two things that can happen. There's an internal control mechanism that every clinical trial has called the Data Safety and Monitoring Board. And they can put a pause onto a study if somebody has a side effect and the first thing that the, the DSMB will do is to see whether the person who got the, the side effect actually got the salt water or the vaccine. And they can basically pause the trial and it can then continue. On the more serious side, if a trial is held, it is held by an external control, usually by a regulatory authority, such as the FDA in the United States, or in Canada, it's Health Canada. And the side effect that may have occurred has to be assessed to see whether it's severe enough to allow the trial to continue. And there are clinical trials in various settings that have been so dangerous that they've stopped at this point and they do not continue. So those mechanisms are always in place for all trials, including vaccine trials. Now here's where we are as of November of this year. There were at least 44 legitimate human trials underway, 11 of which are already in phase three. In other words, they're comparing vaccine and placebo. AstraZeneca has 30,000 people in their trial. There was a September pause and hold because one patient developed a rare complication called transverse myelitis or an infection or an inflammation actually of the spinal cord that caused paralysis. This regrettably happens with a lot of vaccines but in very, very small numbers, but still a very serious side effect. Johnson & Johnson is the only company right now that is purporting to have a one dose or a single dose vaccine. It was paused briefly in October because one of the subjects had a stroke, may or may not have been related, and it was only a pause. They're aiming to get 60,000 volunteers into their study. And we'll speak a little bit more about the Moderna trial and the Pfizer trial in the next couple of slides. With all of these vaccines, there is an expectation that some of these will be winners and some will quite frankly be losers. And the definition of winning and losing is actually relatively uh, low threshold because both the World Health Organization and the American FDA expect only a 50% effectiveness to be deemed a winner. Now, let's bring us up to date. So just about nine, uh, eight, nine days ago, November the 9th, Pfizer, only with a press release, not with a proper scientific publication, suggested that its vaccine was 90% effective. And just this morning, it upped the ante to 95% effectiveness. We do not know the exact demographics of its participants, how many were young, how many were old. And we certainly have no idea of how long lasting the vaccine effect is going to be. The Pfizer vaccine needs two doses per patient three weeks apart. And as some of you have probably heard in the media, it's the one that requires the super cool storage at minus 70. I've heard some people report minus 75, minus 80 degrees. Irrespective, it's really, really cold. And quite frankly, Canada does not have the coolant resources to manage this one effectively yet, although purchasing is going underway. Pfizer has promised 50 million doses later this year and 1.3 billion doses for 2021. The Canadian government has purchased 20 million doses from Pfizer for next year, enough, remember, for 10 million people because everybody needs two doses. So that's the Pfizer story. 
and here's the brief breakdown that we got today. So they improved in a week from 90% to 95%. Interestingly, that's 0.5% more than their competitor, who we're going to talk about next. And here's what the study looked like. They had 170 infections of COVID-19 in total. 172 were in the placebo arm. In other words, the people that got salt water. And only eight were in the vaccine arm. That's where you get the 95% from. However, one of the eight in the vaccine arm was actually a serious COVID infection. A couple of days ago, Moderna, the Massachusetts company, again, only with a press release, not with a full scientific paper, suggested 94.5% effectiveness. Again, no information about the demographics of the participants, no information about how long lasting, two doses per patient, four weeks apart, but requires storage only in regular refrigerator temperatures. Canada has purchased 56 million doses of the Moderna product for 2021 for 28 million people. And once again, here's uh, the breakdown of their study. In their vaccine arm, only five patients had a mild COVID infection. In the placebo or salt water arm, 90 infections, 11 severe. And that, if you do the, the division on that, that's where the 94.5% comes in. So that's the current status of the vaccines. That said, let's look at the supply challenges. And remember, we're now talking about the whole world, unfortunately. So the United States has a majority ownership of one of the products that we haven't heard from yet from Sanofi. And this happened back in March and April. Sanofi then challenged the, uh, the European Union to match US funding to get its fair share. I'm not sure that that matching actually occurred. The United Kingdom, had ownership of the AstraZeneca product done at Oxford. But in May of 2020, the Americans gave AstraZeneca $1.2 billion in return for the first 300 million doses of the AstraZeneca product. In September of this year, the American government gave Johnson & Johnson $1 billion for its first 100 million doses. The AstraZeneca capacity is estimated to be about 2 billion doses per year. Johnson & Johnson claims that it can produce about a billion doses a year. The bottom line, the reason I'm sharing this information is that we may end up with a situation very similar to the old expression, he who pays the piper picks the tune and gets the goods. Mm. Supply challenges for the whole world. Many of you may have realized that China is promising to share with the world. We don't know how genuine this is. We have very significant concerns about the quality of the Chinese product. Is this a public relations gesture? In fact, the European Union just a couple of months ago basically labeled this the politics of generosity. And in addition, I've got to go backwards here. If we look at the Russian situation, the Russians always uh, have promised to share or to, for in some cases, sell to the world. They released their vaccine in 2020, but it's probably essentially best viewed as a large phase three trial. We don't know yet how many participants are involved, and we certainly don't yet have any published long-term follow-up for the Russian product. So where are we here in Canada? So in November, this is the current month, the Canadian government has spent roughly a billion dollars on 72 million doses of the as yet proven Sanofi product and anywhere from 154 to 262 million doses of a variety of other products, largely because what the government is doing is spreading the risk and not putting the eggs all in one basket. Interestingly enough, they've also been at least relatively smart to acquire vials and syringes. The last thing you'd want is vials of vaccine without enough syringes to actually inject it into people's arms. So give them at least a, a kudo for that one. The Canadian government also has additional agreements to purchase the AstraZeneca project the Moderna product that we talked about, and Pfizer, as well as Novovax, Johnson & Johnson, 
and a late comer into it, the only Canadian company, a company based in Quebec called Metacaco. Now, I've written down here rolling review concept. So what that means is that as the data comes in from the various trials, it's given to the regulator, in our case, Health Canada, in doing what's called a rolling review. In the past, all data was accumulated at the very end in one big, huge document was given to Health Canada. So at least what's happening now is that the review is in progress. And when the final data become available, very much like we saw happen with the Pfizer product just last week, then you don't have to go back to square one. You've already got data that's been accumulating for regulatory purposes. Now, the concern that I have and others have is that the vaccine is probably being oversold as the so-called holy grail of the pandemic. We know that it's unlikely to be 100% effective. We know that it's gonna take at least two doses per person initially. And unfortunately, we know that it's not gonna last a lifetime, that it, it will probably end up requiring almost annual dosing, very much like the flu shot. The other thing to think about is who gets it first. And there are WHO criteria as well as in Canada, we have a, a, an organization called the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI or NACI. And there is widespread consensus that who gets it first will be, in some particular order, frontline healthcare workers, the elderly, and fortunately for people like me, the elderly is defined as over 60, indigenous communities, essential workers, including potentially police and grocery workers, and then the immunocompromised and the medically vulnerable. Now, before I talk about those last two, I wanted to point out, as I have in the slide, 20% of all COVID cases in Canada, not deaths, COVID cases are in healthcare workers. So, of course, the priority is there for that reason, plus the fact that if you don't have people around to take care of the sick, the sick are going to get really sick. Now to go to the, to the last two comps, immunocompromised is oftentimes overstated in terms of what that actually means. And I would prefer to think about people as being either immunocompromised or medically vulnerable. And here's the difference. In my opinion, as a hematologist who has patients who are genuinely immunocompromised, it means that their immune system is unable to match to make a proper response to an infection. So that happens because of a whole host of hematologic diseases. It also happens if people are on immunosuppressant medications, such as methotrexate, for example, for a whole host of diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis. On the other hand, and equally important, is patients who are medically vulnerable. And what I mean by that is that if you have asthma, diabetes, hypertension, or chronic lung health or uh, heart or liver disease, if you get COVID, your body isn't able to respond and deal with it effectively. So you're not immunocompromised in the strict sense of the word, but you're medically vulnerable because of the underlying health condition that you have. Now, scaling up the vaccine is not gonna be easy. And I've put the COVAX agreement here because many people don't realize that Canada, as well as over 100 countries, have entered into a, an agreement where they will share a proportion of their vaccine with poor countries in the world for no cost, recognizing that this is a worldwide issue. So those numbers that I counted before in terms of how many doses we get we're anticipating that some fraction of those doses will be sent to underdeveloped countries in the world as part of the COVAX agreement. In addition, there will be some logistic issues related to deployment. If we start with the Pfizer vaccine, we know that we do not have routine capacity for minus seven degree storage. One report that I saw a couple of weeks ago suggested that if the entire Canadian population had to receive the Pfizer product, we would need to make 500 trailer trucks with super cold capacity. Just imagine a parking lot with 500 
big trailer trucks that have super refrigeration capacity. The Pfizer product, by the way, once it's thawed, has to be used in five days. Not probably a big concern, depending upon what happens uh, in discussion I'm going to have in the next slide or two. The next issue becomes, where is it going to be given? It's probable that unlike the flu vaccine, the initial doses of vaccine will have to be given in some centralized facility, one, to avoid wastage, and two, to monitor that the first patients who are getting it, the first people, sorry, that are getting it, are part of the priority group. That's gonna be a challenge for smaller, more remote communities. And in addition, even though there were lots of people on that priority slide that I showed a few slides ago, there is every expectation that there will be, have to be some kind of lottery system within the priority group because we will not get all 50 or 60 million doses all at once. So from that point of view, even if you're, for example, a frontline healthcare worker, there may have to be a lottery for who gets it in January, who might then get the next aliquot of supplies in February, March, and so on. So it's not going to be an easy logistic challenge. I did a rough calculation about how quickly vaccines can be given. We have 14.5 million people living in Ontario. We do anywhere between 30 uh, and 45,000 COVID tests per day. So I just chose the number of 30,000 vaccinations per day, seven days a week. And it would take 483 days for the entire population of Ontario to be vaccinated for their first dose. But you have to double that because remember, everybody needs two doses three weeks apart. So unless that 30,000 was to be substantially increased, it's going to take time, even if product is available, to get everybody vaccinated. So that brings us to some speculation about the future with COVID-19. First of all, most importantly perhaps, is what's gonna happen with vaccine uptake? There is no doubt that there will be early adopters, especially those people who are in the early major priority list. There's also no doubt that there will be a private market for this that will be exposed by the media probably on the second day. And just for comparison, if we looked at the last three years of data on flu shot uptake, it was only 33% of the population or 5 million doses. So we can't instantly assume that we're gonna snap our fingers and all 14.5 million people will line up to get the vaccine. There will be a substantial wait and see cohort. They'll wait to see whether the vaccine is truly effective and truly safe. And one of the things that I think we all have to be prepared for is that there will be a case or two, hopefully only a case or two, of a serious complication. This happens with virtually every product that you inject into a person. And if we're thinking of approaching 10 million dose uh, people in Ontario, there will be complications. And unfortunately, the media will spend an enormous amount of time mm -hmm. on those unfortunate single individuals who have that complication. And we have the risk of losing perspective on the overall benefit versus the anticipated and very tragic downside for some individuals. That's why there will be people who will be vaccine hesitant. And also, of course, we know that there's a defined population of people who are anti-vaxxers to begin with and likely won't change that attitude with COVID vaccines. So the vaccine will be arriving sometime in the, the uh, winter or spring. We know that it's not going to be 100% effective, and we're going to expect mutations annually. Mutations, by the way, have already been detected. Fortunately, some of the mutations seem to suggest that the mutated COVID may be less serious, but that's only very early data, and it certainly isn't going to be generalizable. The most important question for the vaccine is, will we ever achieve what so-called herd immunity means? In other words, 60 to 80% of the population either having had the infection, which we certainly hope isn't gonna happen, 
or 60 to 80 percent of the population being vaccinated. For practical purposes, although there's been some controversy about this and what many of you may have heard about is the Great Barrington Declaration, herd immunity by natural infection would be devastating. It is absolutely not the right way to achieve herd immunity because so many hundreds of thousands of people would die in doing that. The only meaningful way in which to get herd immunity is via vaccination. And so we have the same tussle between how many people will actually sign up and get the vaccine and how ultimately effective it will be and how long lasting it will be. The vaccine has arrived, but what happens if I do get COVID-19? Will there be therapies available? I think that there is some optimism. We know that more patients are surviving hospitalizations now than earlier on, but it's certainly not going to be a slam dunk that anybody who gets it will be able to leave hospital and an ICU without potential serious complications, including death. The vaccine has arrived, but I still think, especially for most of next year, we're going to all have to undergo an individual risk assessment. And the things that I've written here in red are things obviously on the downside. And the one thing on the, the slide is on the upside. Your age will clearly play a role. Are you immunocompromised? Are you taking a medicine that actually suppresses your immune system to keep some disease under control? There are a lot of people who have a lot of conditions that are currently being treated by immunosuppressant medications. Am I medically vulnerable? If you remember that list, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, chronic lung, heart, and liver disease, there are a lot of people in our province who have medical vulnerability. Am I, in fact, vaccine hesitant? Do I have blood groups A and B? Because there is evidence that people with blood groups A and B are slightly more likely to get sick with COVID. And on the plus side, there is evidence to suggest that if you're on blood thinners like Coumadin or Warfarin, you may be slightly protected. Those last two probably cancel each other out. So those are sort of early risk assessments that you might want to be aware of. And I think that we're still going to have to apply an individual risk, risk assessment, especially going into 2021. Am I willing to sacrifice some social interactions? Am I willing to continue wearing a mask? What other precautions can I take? Perhaps very appropriate for tonight's session is will virtual meetings be sufficient for my professional needs, for my social needs? And perhaps even more important in the long term, will virtual care by my physician be sufficient? Because that's going to be here to stay in some measure. We're now beginning to see a situation where our governments are failing to anticipate and failing to use scientific projections early enough. The governments are slow to react and very timid to enforce regulations that may be in place. And in that regard, I think that our personal behaviors as citizens are vital. It is important to stay at home, to be virtual, not in person as we are right now to take out, not to dine in, to shop online, not in store, to wear a mask, to wash your hands, and perhaps even more important, to donate to local charities supporting the vulnerable. I think it is fundamentally government's responsibility to support those businesses that have to compromise. And finally, before I do the last couple of points, it's really important to thank all the healthcare professionals out there on the front lines. It's not me anymore because I've been doing all of my final patient care from home here, but also to thank everybody who's doing their part in this particular pandemic. And although I don't intend this to be a terribly religious end to the presentation, I think we really need to pray in the next couple of months for all who are in long-term care. And sadly, we have to pray for the entire United States of America. A humanitarian disaster, as Sanjay Gupta on CNN declared, is upon them. They're going to be hit with Thanksgiving, with Black Friday and Christmas 
at a time where we know that 73 million Americans of voting age may not fully understand the implications of what they're doing. I've never finished a slideshow like this, but I want to say, first of all, sorry for some of the news that I've been able to share with you. Thank you for your attention, and I'm very willing to answer any questions that you may have to pose. So good. Can you stop this screen sharing? Peter? I will do that. Yeah, and then we can see the comments. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. I can't see any questions. Excited to be learning with you all tonight. Kids are screaming on the background. Terrific presentation. Will all Canadians be able to get the vaccine before Canada provides it to other countries? Uh, thank you for that question. I think the answer is not likely. I think that there is an effort, as I've understood the COVAX agreement, that we will not be having rich company, uh, countries taking the whole share before they start sharing with others. We don't have any information yet as to how, what the ratio of the sharing will be but it's almost certain that it won't be 100% Canadians before the rest of the world starts getting our share, sadly. And that's part of, I guess, our larger global sense of social responsibility, whether we like it or not. Now, you would appreciate that up until January the 20th, the Americans will have a very different answer to that question. It would be America first, but by that time, the vaccine will just be rolling out. So it'll be interesting to see how the president-elect deals with that particular question. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think that uh, President Trump signed on to the COVAX agreement. So Mick is asking, for vaccine trials, are each company testing a single vaccine or do they each have multiple vac vaccines that they are trying? Uh, good question. Uh, first of all, that's probably proprietary secret information. It's possible that some of them are trying a couple of different ones, but if you're trying to enroll 30, 40, 60,000 people, the power calculation, the statistical calculation you need would be severely compromised if you had two different vaccines in play. So the likelihood is that the major companies will have a single vaccine. Now, the good news is that many of the other vaccines that we haven't heard about yet in press release are probably using the same target. And the target that's being used for the vaccine is the spike, the spike that you've all seen in these uh, various renditions of the virus. And I heard a very interesting analogy once. It's like uh, if you took a car and its license plate, the spike is like the license plate. All you need to do is know that it's a car. You don't need to know the rest of the details in order to start attacking it. So the spike is a very small part of it, but a very useful target for vaccine creation. And many of the other companies, the competitors, are in the same ballpark. So there's a fair amount of optimism that as the products from Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca come out, they may well have the same kind of effectiveness as the initial two Pfizer and Moderna products. Uh, Ants Toy saying, hi Peter, thank you for one of the best overviews of COVID situation that I have heard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Toy. <laughs> That's high praise from, from uh, my colleague. Enelomp is asking, there are many N95 type masks. Do you recommend and uh, what are the differences? Well, as I mentioned, Anna, the, the challenge with N95 masks is that they have to be individually fitted for you. And what that fitting, that's not an easy process that can be done sort of uh, in a store. It involves basically putting yourself under a plastic hood and testing to see whether the N95 is fitting properly for you. So in, at Sunnybrook, for example, that's done every two years. 
for every staff physician and every staff nurse and other who is likely going to be in direct patient contact. So it's very different from just sort of uh, going to the store and seeing if something fits. There's a very strict process to make sure that you've got the right model, the right company, and the right model number for N95s. Anstoy again, what has happened to the regular flu? How does the mortality, morbidity of COVID compare to usual flu? So right now, we had some interesting data yesterday to suggest that we're, we're experiencing 90% less of the regular flu uh, as of yesterday, something like uh, 70 cases as opposed to 700 cases last year at this time. The most likely reason for that is that everybody is social distancing, wearing masks, and washing their hands. So we don't really know whether the so-called twindemic is going to occur, because if most patients are doing what we always wanted people to do during flu season, but they're really doing it seriously now, that's actually caused, hopefully, a significant decrease in the regular influenza that we experience every year. That influenza, by the way, typically in Canada, uh, kills about three and a half thousand people every year. Unfortunately, most of them elderly. Thank you, Peter. It seems that the vaccine is what is being concentrated on, but what is the situation regarding all the various studies going on around the world of prophylactic alternatives? Some seem to be quite promising, or is this not really the case? Um, well, there's a little bit going on prophylactically. Uh, there, you know, as I mentioned, the McMaster study is looking to see whether aspirin could be helpful, but that would be a dangerous prophylactic because of risk of bleeding. Uh, many of you will recall that there was a lot of early uh, enthusiasm about the uh, hydroxychloroquine azithromycin combination that the now soon to be departed President of the United States was supporting though the legitimate studies for that have basically uh, quashed the notion that there would be any pro prophylactic benefit to that. I'm not aware of any other serious studies. There was a report just yesterday about a mouthwash that might help to prevent it, but really way too early. And, uh, and quite frankly, I'm not aware of any serious studies that are looking at a genuine prophylaxis, other than of course, the infamous wearing of masks, which is still a challenge, by the way, in many parts of the world. As uh, if you follow the international perspective, especially in Mar many American states, the notion that you may have to wear a mask indoors is still very foreign. It's, it's pretty routinely understood by us in Canada, but it's by no means uh, common across the rest of the world. So, Peter Martin, why have we not heard anything about the strategy of strengthening one's immune system to avoid becoming infected? I follow an extensive program suggested by a doctor, one element of which is quercetin or whatever it is, which has some impressive experimental results. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people over the decades have hoped to have something that is good for helping the immune system. I think what we've discovered with COVID-19 is that it's such a novel virus that has so many downstream negative effects that uh, the, the prophylactic efforts that people try simply don't seem to be enough. The, the most important thing about the COVID virus is the asymptomatic spread. That's why it's so devastating worldwide right now. No other virus before has been allowed to be so contagious with the patient being so asymptomatic. We really have to keep on emphasizing that. And that's why the emphasis on all of these public health measures, like keeping your distance, wearing a mask and so on. Because you don't know, somebody may look well. If you compare that to SARS, when, when a SARS patient came into the hospital, they looked sick, period. Whereas here, the, the initial phase of a COVID illness can be very benign and hence the, the great risk of it spreading. So next, Annette, obviously washing our hands and sanitizing is super important right now. Is there a long-term danger in 
this with respect to our immune system's ability to fight germs? Hey, interesting question. Um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting question. The way in which I'd answer that question is the way I answer questions about people getting chemotherapy for, for curable cancers. Uh, you can, there are certainly long-term side effects, but you want to be alive to be able to experience those side effects. And I don't want to make light of that comparison because it's a very real discussion. Sometimes we worry too much about what might happen without spending enough time thinking about what we're really trying to prevent. Now, the argument that, that Aneta points out is that we're changing our skin microflora to some degree. But the reality is that most of us live in pretty, you know, semi-dirty environments all the time. So it's not as if we sterilize ourselves one minute and then all of a sudden we're pure for the rest of the day. Unless you're an obsessive compulsive psychiatric disorder and you're washing your hands a hundred times a day, it's unlikely that you're gonna have much in the, t in, in the sense of a microflora rearrangement. What you can of course have is skin irritation and various kinds of dermatologic problems if you really are in a position such as many healthcare professionals in having to wash their hands 10, 20, 30 times a day. So, Miku again. Uh, where, where is this? For the countries that have very low rates, has an analysis been done on how contact tracing relates to keeping the infected cases down? Oh, yes. I mean, great question, Mikkel. Uh, if you look at the situation in New Zealand, but especially, of course, in Korea and Japan, extremely aggressive contract tracing. And in fact, in, in some situations, to try to bring an infection under control, legitimately quarantining patients in special facilities, not allowing them to be home quarantined, with all of the uncertainty related to this. You may remember there was a situation even in our country in Nova Scotia, I think it was, or PEI, one of those two provinces where somebody who was failing quarantine was actually put in jail to make sure that they didn't infect others. So what's been characteristic about the, uh, the experience in Taiwan, Korea, and Japan is very strict enforcement of quarantine and very aggressive contact tracing. That, that's the magic formula, and we can all learn from that. Unfortunately, as some of you may have uh, picked up in the, in the media, the, uh, the County of Peel, for example, Brampton and Mississauga, failed as of Monday, could not do contact tracing anymore. It didn't have the human resources to do contract tracing. So that's a, you know, a relative failing of our system, which was dealt with properly by Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. And of course, to be honest, different cultural expectations also. If, we, if, if I was a sociologist, which I don't pretend to be, one can imagine that there are different attitudes about government responsibility versus personal freedom that mm -hmm. has an influence on some of that data that are presented. As I mentioned in my commentary, Sweden, for example, took a very lackadaisical approach in the early days. It was widely studied to see, hey, how are they getting away with it? And the reality is that they finally admitted a few months ago they weren't getting away with it. And now in a, in a country of 10 million people, they've had uh, somewhere in excess of 6,000 people die. Anstoy, what is the status of pets and animals catching and spreading COVID? Very small case reports. Uh, there, are, there was an initial early case report in New York City of a tiger in the zoo having COVID. There are very, very scattered cases of dogs and cats with COVID. So the risk is unlikely, but they have gotten infected. And I think uh, one of the animals actually succumbed to it. I, I don't really keep track of the veterinary medicine too much, but I don't think there's been uh, much in the way of animal to human transmission of COVID. Andres Kosakamps, have you been following the situation in Estonia? Why did Estonia do well uh, in the spring, but right now is struggling? Uh, 
Well, I think the answer for that, as with most countries that did well in the spring, and by the way, as I mentioned before, Estonia is very much similar to Denmark, Norway, Finland, not Sweden, uh, to all those countries, is that they put a lot of effort into locking down almost fully in the spring. Then came the summer, and as we've all experienced it, people got liberated, uh, life became a little bit easier, and as the second wave came, very much like in 1918, people were not prepared and governments were not prepared to lock down quickly enough. If you speak to most physicians who are involved in hospital administration, they would have already suggested a, a full lockdown, very or virtually full lockdown, very similar to what we had in March and April back several months ago, or at least several weeks ago after Halloween. So I think it's just a sort of a natural human tendency to uh, not be as aware. So next question, Merli and Tavi Tamtik, great presentation, enjoyed it, uh, enjoyed it a lot. What is your perspective on China reporting extremely low numbers of COVID cases? Well, the simple answer uh, is that the, uh, China is controlled by the Communist Party. And so there's a, there's a general disbelief in uh, any data that comes from China, unfortunately. One of the things that I didn't mention on my slides, I actually excluded it, was that Canada and China had a vaccine agreement until about three months ago. And when the Canadian authorities were trying to get more information about how the trials were going, the information was not coming. And we actually terminated what was called the, the Canadian Sino vaccine agreement. So in general terms, it's, it's basically a, a lack of trust in the data. Uh, Hans Doi, what updates on testing? Test accuracy, ra ra rapid tests, home tests? Um, I'm not completely up to date on that question, Hans, but I would say that there's been enthusiasm for more rapid home tests. But remember that the purpose of those kinds of rapid tests is to serve as a screen. And if it tests positive, then you still have to have the more definitive testing to make sure that you're not just a false positive. So it's part of the solution. It's something that I haven't personally kept uh, that much up to date with. There hasn't been a major breakthrough. There are a lot of small companies that are coming up with a suggestion that they've got the right product. Abbott in the United States is probably the largest legitimate purveyor of uh, rapid testing. Uh, many of you may remember that there was a Canadian company who produced a little square that was wonderful in trials and uh, in, the, in the real world didn't function at all. So it was taken off the market. So there's always a little bit of, as I mentioned in one of my early slides, the risk of the rush to results, which we always have to be a bit careful about. Enelomp says, for your information, learned yesterday that wearing masks in Sweden remains uncommon. Yeah. Yeah, I would say the same for Estonia. Yeah, pretty much. But, but the, yeah, it's it's a very it's a very strange situation. As I said, the when I listened to the BBC in the spring and the summer, uh, it would almost always sort of look to see how well things were happening in Sweden because Sweden had a very different approach to the rest of Europe, and unfortunately now the as the old expression would go, the chickens have come home to roost, and they're too high on that list of uh, reputable countries. Tom Marley, how did Spanish flu affect Estonia? I don't know. Uh, the, the one thing to say about Spanish flu, one of, the, one of the major reasons, by the way, and this is not answering Tom's question at all, but it may be a partial answer. Uh, the Spanish flu was as serious as it was because of the, the effects of the First World War and a significant amount of malnutrition that was occurring in many countries that were affected by the war. So my assumption would be that Estonia would have been one of those countries, but I have no data whatsoever on uh, Spanish flu. Um, many of you may have, have grandparents or great grandparents who could have succumbed to that infection. It was not uncommon. If you think about the, the number of people that were infected, many families might have had a story of somebody dying of what could have been the Spanish flu but in a situation where a lot of people were very sick and malnourished to begin with, and of course, very little testing, many patients in that country may not have actually sought medical attention. 
Jan Meri, what do you see as being our biggest risk going forward? Well, on a societal basis, the biggest risk that I see is not enough people being vaccinated to generate herd immunity. To me, that would be the one uh, thing that if we had 60 or 80 percent of the population uh, getting vaccinated, that we would begin to think about many aspects of what we used to call our normal life before that. We might still wear a mask or two and nobody would laugh at us the way we used to laugh at certain people who used to wear masks many years ago. So at a societal level, that's the, that's the biggest concern. On an individual basis, as I indicated in several of my last slides, we all have to basically sit down and take stock of our own individual circumstances and adjust our risk appropriately. It's not going to be a one size fits all. If, if you're, and I'll speak about myself, if I'm older, I'm immunocompromised because of medicines that I have to take. Uh, I can manage professionally, uh, unfortunately, on Zoom. I still try to do some social functions with masks if safe, but I'll be making individual decisions on what I want to do, what I think is safe to do well into 2021. I hope that it doesn't have to continue very much in 2022. And I'm also blood group uh, A, so I'm, I'm a sort of three, three strikes against me already. That's bad enough in baseball. Mm -hmm. I have a question. As a cultural worker, we have to make plans for the next year. What is the first time we could have a next Estonian Music Week? or celebrate Tartu College 50? Oh, very good question. And I'm sure that a lot of companies are asking that. And it really depends on the uptake of the vaccine, how our supplies come through, whether it's as optimistic as the promises of the country, how much, as, as Annette asked earlier, how much may be deflected to other countries, whether the supply will really come through, but most importantly, will we achieve that 60, 70, 80%? It's not a given. Remember, our baseline that we're comparing to was the flu shot that I think that at the most in 2017 was 40%, and it was less in the other year. So it averaged about one third of eligible people getting the, the flu shot. So we'd have to double that with COVID to, to be, have a chance of herd immunity. That then defines the ability to begin to function more normally and have more people in the audience as opposed to you know 10 people in a room that was originally scheduled to fit 200, because that really wouldn't be a good Estonian Music Week. So now oh. 2021. Well, I'd be, I'd be very cautious about 2021, except maybe toward the very end of the year. And it all depends upon how actively we can get uh, the vaccines into play. But as I said, even, even with vaccines, uh, there will still be the need for individuals to assess. So I think that, that any, any organization should plan virtual because there will still be customers that will want to participate virtually, even if the in-person option is there. And I think that's what a lot, of, a lot of organizations, a lot of companies are discovering that they may want to have a hybrid of both in-person and, uh, and virtual options. Thank you. So, some more thank yous. Ole Maimets, Aitäh Peter, wonderful and highly informative presentation. Smile. Tom Marle, I have not read nor heard anything about Spanish flu in Estonia. 1918, uh, 1920 was the most important time in Estonian history. Great presentation, Peter. And Krista Spence, thanks, Peter, for your clear presentation. Aitäh, Peter. Well, thank you all for participating, and thank you all for your questions. I, I always appreciate the fact that the questions are as important as the presentation is itself. So I hope the presentation was helpful, and I equally hope that the answers to the question and as I said on my last slide, I'm sorry to try to be so accurate and so truthful, but uh, it, it is a reality that we have to deal with. And, and I hope that we can all uh, do as much as we can individually as groups and get through this.
Yeah, you, know, um, you said that this was going to be available on on uh, YouTube. On YouTube, okay. Yes, yeah, we'll post know, it on YouTube. I just noticed something here is that a lot of the most of the people here are older than, uh, like in the older age group, not in the younger. So I think everyone should just sort of take a chance when it comes on YouTube to be able to pass that link on to other people to see it and also especially try to get it to some of the younger people because uh, there is the bigger concern that it's a lot of the younger generation that is still the one going out and are causing a lot of the sec secondary second wave up. Sure, we'll post it and that's a great tool to fight all the anti-maskers and that uh, anti-vaccines and all those anti-people because really people need information which they can understand and relate to and the way you presented it it was brilliant so tuha tänu peter Aitäh. stay safe stay home talk to your friends and family we have zoom and all those platforms so see you next wednesday on vemu channel okay Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. That's it.